Just because cells are small does not mean they aren't complex. Eukaryotic cells have dozens or even hundreds of tiny components called organelles that are constantly completing tasks to keep the cell alive. In this video, we are going to cover some of the most important organelles and see how they function to keep cells alive. Plus, this information will be on the AP test, so stick with us as we cover everything you need to know about cell organelles. Here is an outline of what we will be covering. First, we'll take a look at the endoplasmic reticulum, both the smooth and the rough parts. Then, we'll analyze lysosomes and their digestive functions. Before the quiz, we'll take a look at vacuoles and the things they store. Then, we'll look at how cells produce energy. Finally, we will see how chloroplasts work with mitochondria to capture, store, and utilize energy. If you only need to review one part of this section, feel free to fast forward to the part you need. This section dives further into organelles and divides them into two functional groups, organelles that maintain and repair the cell, and organelles that function to collect and distribute the energy needed for biochemical reactions. Let's start with organelles that maintain and repair cellular components. Whether it is a prokaryotic organism or a eukaryotic organism, many functions must be completed continuously in order for a cell to survive and reproduce. For instance, cells must digest food, create new products, and duplicate their DNA. If we look at the cell membrane alone, we can start to understand the types of repair and maintenance tasks that need to be conducted. For instance, the phospholipids that create a cell membrane are constantly breaking down. These need to be replaced, and many more need to be created as the cell grows. Further, the cell needs to create new proteins to fill the new cell membrane and make it fully functional. The endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi complex are both a part of the endomembrane system, a series of membranes that form distinct chambers within a cell. These chambers can have completely different chemical properties than the cytosol surrounding them. The endoplasmic reticulum has two distinct portions, the rough ER and the smooth ER. The rough ER is covered in ribosomes, which actively synthesize new polypeptide chains and deposit them into the various chambers created by the folded ER membrane. As the protein enters the ER lumen, the inside of the ER, the protein enters the proper environment needed to fold and become functional. Some of these proteins get placed directly in the membrane of the ER, which can then bud off as transport vesicles destined for the Golgi complex or the cell membrane itself. The proteins created in the rough ER are kept out of the cytoplasm, where they may cause issues if they were allowed to function within the cell. Proteins needed in the cytosol are most often created by ribosomes directly in the cytosol. The rough ER is also able to synthesize phospholipids to create new membranes. The smooth ER has a variety of functions, and is also responsible for synthesizing phospholipids to replace what it loses to transport vesicles. However, the smooth ER also synthesizes a variety of other lipids, from fats to hormones, depending on the cell's type. For instance, cells that produce the lipid-based sex hormones in animals are often loaded with smooth endoplasmic reticulum because they are responsible for producing all of the sex hormones the organism needs to successfully reproduce. Let's take a quick break and see just how active cells can be. Plants are the most abundant organism on the planet, and they need to produce many proteins and cellular components to keep growing. One protein, Rubisco, is the most abundant protein in plants and is used in the process of creating glucose. Scientists have estimated that it, plants create 30 billion tons of Rubisco protein each year. One elephant weighs around six tons, so plants have to create over five billion elephants worth of rubisco protein every year. That's a lot of elephants. Your body has an immune system, which continuously fights off bacterial infections. The most important organelles needed for this fight are lysosomes. The white blood cells that travel around your body are constantly looking for bacterial cells. When they find one, they eat it in a process known as phagocytosis. This essentially the same process that single-celled organisms use to obtain food. 
This process starts when the cell membrane envelops a bacterial cell. However, enveloping the bacteria in a cellular membrane simply traps the bacteria in a food vacuole. Lysosomes are how the cell digests that material. Lysosomes attach to the food vesicle and merge with the lipid bilayer. As they do so, they dump their acid contents and hydrolytic enzymes into the food vacuole. This digests the bacteria inside the cell by breaking apart all of the polymers with hydration reactions. The molecules can then be used around the cytoplasm. Any waste products are dumped back into the bloodstream where they will be removed by the kidneys and liver. The cell will then create more lysosomes with the Golgi complex ready for the next bacterial cell it encounters. Vacuoles are also a part of the endomembrane system and they store a variety of substances. In general, the membrane of a vacuole is loaded with specific proteins that import specific substances into the vacuole. This takes the substances out of the cytoplasm, so the chemistry of the cytoplasm can remain consistent and reliable. The chemistry of the vacuole is not important, since no new molecules are synthesized here. There are two special types of vacuole that we should consider. A contractile vacuole is found in many freshwater organisms. Freshwater organisms live in a hypotonic environment. This means that water is constantly flowing into the cell. The contra contractile vacuole takes this water and begins to fill up. Then, the vacuole pumps that water out of the cell at regular intervals. This allows the cell to remain at a consistent pH and water content despite the constant influx of water. Plants also rely on vacuoles but for a much different reason. Plant cells have a large central vacuole with, which fills with water. When this vacuole is full, it pushes outward on the cell walls. Each cell wall pushes on the cell walls next to it, creating a turgid plant. When a plant does not have water, these vacuoles slowly empty, leading to a flaccid plant that usually dies. While this is the main function of the central vacuole, Plants also use them to store a variety of substances. For instance, some plants store toxins in their vacuole that can kill insects if they try to feed on the plant. You can now pause the video and answer the questions below. There is another quiz at the end of the test and you can find all of the answers to the questions in this video through the quick test prep link in the description. While the endomembrane system is highly specialized for maintaining and repairing a growing cell, other organelles are responsible for capturing, storing, and utilizing the energy needed to power the many reactions the endomembrane system needs to complete. These organelles are chloroplasts and mitochondria. Both of these organelles have a double membrane system, likely because they evolved from symbiotic bacteria billions of years ago. The endosymbiotic theory states that early eukaryotic cells phagocytized smaller bacteria. Instead of being digested with lysosomes, these bacteria evolved a symbiosis with the cells, allowing them to produce and utilize energy more efficiently. The inner membranes of these organelles are highly folded to increase the amount of surface area the organelle uses to complete important biochemical reactions. In mitochondria, the folds of the inner membrane are called cristae, and they house the electron transport chain that helps move energy from the bonds of glucose to the bonds of ATP. In chloroplasts, the inner membrane is distinctly folded into a large number of thylakoids. These disc-like structures are stacked into units called a granum, and each chloroplast is filled with a large number of grana. Thylakoids work to capture the energy from sunlight, and also have a system of electron transport chains, known as photosystems, that capture the energy and use it to form molecules of glucose. Together, these two organelles provide energy for almost all of the life on Earth in one way or another. Hey, don't go cross-eyed. If you need a break, now's a good time. Get some water, go for a walk, and remember that taking frequent breaks can help you focus and retain more information on the test. Just remember to come back and finish the video. Plant cells are packed full of chloroplasts. 
which produce sugar through the complex process of photosynthesis. This process starts in the membrane of the thylakoids. To maximize the amount of sunlight that can be captured, the thylakoids are stacked together tightly and fill up most of the internal space within the chloroplast. But the real magic happens at the level of the photosystems. The photosystems consist of a series of proteins embedded into the membrane of the thylakoid. Though later sections of the AP Biology curriculum address this process further, these photosystems work by capturing energy with the pigment molecule chlorophyll. This energy is then used to split a water molecule. The energy release travels through an electron trans transport chain and through ATP synthase to create NADH and ATPH, both of which can power other reactions. These molecules are transferred to the stroma of the chloroplast, where the Calvin cycle takes place. This process, also known as carbon fixation, essentially uses the energy in ATP and NADH to generate sugar molecules from smaller carbon dioxide molecules. As we will see, this is essentially the exact opposite of what happens in a mitochondria. Once chloroplasts have created glucose, the energy within glucose can be utilized by a mitochondrion. The first step of getting access to this energy is breaking down 6-carbon glucose into a 3-carbon molecule within the cytosol, a process known as glycolysis. Then a smaller 3-carbon molecule can be imported into the mitochondrial matrix. This molecule then enters the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. Essentially, this process is the same as the Calvin cycle seen in photosynthesis only in reverse. The 3-carbon molecule is added to another 3-carbon molecule to form a 6-carbon molecule. Through a series of biochemical reactions, the molecule is slowly torn apart, releasing carbon dioxide and creating NADH and FADH as well as a tiny amount of ATP. These electron carriers, NADH and FADH, make their way to the electron transport chain located on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. First, these electron carriers dump their electrons and energy into membrane-bound proteins. These proteins use the energy to pump hydrogens into the intermembrane space between the inner and outer mitochondrial membranes. Then, ATP synthase uses the hydrogen gradient that has been created to make many more ATP molecules. These ATP molecules can be exported from the mitochondria to power reactions throughout the cell, from creating new lipids in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum to synthesizing new DNA molecules before cell division. You can now pause the video again and answer this second set of questions. Answers to all of the questions in this video can be found through the quick test prep link in the video description. You should also check out all of the other resources we have created for this section. They can help you study for the AP test. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like button and leave us any comments or questions you have about the structure or function of organelles. Be sure to subscribe to the Biology Dictionary channel to find all of our AP Biology videos. Good luck!